Hi, everyone. Welcome to 111th Stanford Media Group Exchange session. This week, we have Sayyid Muhammad Anwar uh, here with us to talk about his work on self supervised learning for chest X ray analysis. Dr. Anwar is a PI at the Children's National Hospital and Associate Professor of Radiology and Pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Within the hospital, he is associated with Sheikh Zayed Institute of Pediatric Surgical Innovations, doing cutting edge research in uh, surgical planning, treatment, and device innovation. His research interests include developing computational and engineering solutions for healthcare systems that benefit from computer vision, signal processing, and artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Anwar, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you would like to take questions? Is it okay yeah, if we interrupt you in the middle? For... Oh, yeah, definitely in interrupt. I'm planning like 40, 45 minutes for presentation, but uh, I, I think it's good if it's a discussion. Okay, uh, then everyone, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Dr. Anwar. Yeah, thank you again for the introduction. So uh, as you see the title, I will be talking about self-supervised learning in just X-ray analysis uh, as, as a major part of this presentation, but I will also in the later part of the presentation introduce a little bit more about our group. Uh, so we are as a group based in uh, Children's National Hospital. Uh, uh, so we are trying to, our, our main aim and goal in the in the lab is to develop AI machine learning algorithms for pediatric applications. Uh, and some of the challenges that come with pediatric applications, uh, I think the one one of the biggest challenge is limited availability of data. Uh, I think in, in the recent past, there are developments in the deep learning machine learning field that maybe somehow solve these things, but uh, this has been a long standing challenge for pediatric applications and one of the reason, as far as I can see in the hospital, uh, the application uh, spectrum is limited as compared to adult health conditions. So, so this is something I will kind of cover as well. Some of the applications you will see in this presentation, we'll look at pediatric data sets, which are very small, and we will see how machine learning generally fails if we use standard methods, but we need to make some adjustment to make that happen. So uh, as we all know, deep learning has been making a lot of impact in uh, the medical imaging field uh, for all sorts of stars like segmentation, diagnosis, and mostly in radiology, uh, a lot of impact has been seen. And in recent years, uh, FDA is approving a lot of deep learning algorithms. Um, I think around 75% of those algorithms are in radiology. So. Uh, medical imaging and radiology in, in specific has seen a lot of impact from these recent developments in deep learning technology. Uh, so since I'm talking about self-supervised learning, one of the core of self-supervised learning is we have a pre-trained model, uh, which is trained on a large data set. Uh, this has mostly been done in the computer vision space uh, using ImageNet, which is one of the largest collection of real world data sets. Uh, but when we take those models and try try to either do transfer learning or finding for medical imaging tasks, uh, they tend to fail. Uh, one of the reason could be that they have limited ability to capture characteristics that are related to medical images because ImageNet does not contain a lot of medical images. Uh, they also have, it has been found in literature uh, that they have suboptimal performance for medical imaging tasks. They could also have limited generalizability. So if you are able to train it on one particular task or data from one particular hospital or population, uh, the model fails when it's taken to another population or an hospital. Uh, there's also a big risk of propagating bias from unrelated data sets, which ImageNet is kind of an unrelated to clinical applications. Uh, so for, for the last year, we are seeing a lot of foundation models coming out in the computer vision space and the large language model space. Uh, so what I will focus on this uh, in this presentation is to make specific foundation models. Uh, the idea is to narrow down how the training is done into some specific domain. 
uh, for example, chest X-rays, as, as we will explore in this presentation. Um, what we want to do by that is to capture unique patterns, structures, or texture, textures of medical images when we, for example, train domain-specific foundation models in the medical imaging space. Uh, so we now have actually trained uh, a large model. I would say it's a large model because we are trying to use as much as possible in terms of the data that is available for chest X-rays. Uh, in the public space. Uh, and then based on that trained model, I will show some use cases on uh, data sets that are pediatric, so small, uh, and mostly collected in our limited settings. So for example, I will talk about acute chest syndrome identifications in sickle cell disease, which itself is a condition which is which affects a certain population. And what I will show is some results on uh, pediatric acute chest syndrome data set. Also tuberculosis detection. TB is not very common in pediatrics, but we have a data set uh, collected at Children's Hospital um, and we applied our models on this detection. Uh, pediatric lung segmentation is, uh, is an important segmentation task. Uh, the pediatric lungs look very different from adult lungs. Especially, we have data set from premature babies, which is uh, like totally different in terms of how it looks like. Uh, so it's it's a unique uh, data set for experimenting with how the foundation model is working in this space. Uh, I will also briefly touch on uh, the security and privacy aspect of uh, machine learning uh, and talk about one study where we are looking at federated learning, which is considered to be privacy preserving because we, we are not sharing data, but how even in federated learning settings, uh, there are ways of recreating data on which the model is trained on. Um, I have a quick question, Saeed. So yeah. when you say pediatric, um, does it include all the way from mm, like premature neonates or until like say 18 years of age? Like, is there a wide disparity between like even subgroups within the pediatric um, like group? So very good question. And this is another big challenge because uh, generally what the type of data that we deal with is from premature babies to generally like 18 to 21 years, so adolescents. Uh, now this, this itself has a lot of variation. It is going from like a premature lung to a, a for, for example, a teenager might have a fully grown lung. Uh, so we try to create groups where we can, uh, but when we create groups, it still further divides the data. That's created another challenge. So uh, some of the results you will, so acute chest syndrome, generally age group is uh, maybe one year to seven, eight years. Uh, so that that's how it works. But generally for all our studies, this is a very important aspect and we have to consider this because uh, things change in different age groups. Got it. Thank you. So the lung segmentation I will show is premature babies and uh, and small babies, which are like less than two years, not not like up to eighteen years or twenty one years. So I just wanted to quickly bring to your attention some of. These are very recent papers, as you, as you can see, mostly 2024, last month or this month. Uh, these are domain-specific foundation models, as far as I can see. Two of them are computational pathology. And I think one of the speaker last for your last week presentation is an author on this. So I was just looking at the profiles. But this is uh, like just looking into this space and making a case for domain-specific foundation models. These are trained on pathology images. So this is very specific uh, situation. Uh, then there's also this paper, which talks about generalist foundation model. And I think this is a debate. Uh, do we need generalist models or do we need specialized models? Um, maybe there's a fine line and we need to define based on the application we are trying to solve. Uh, so this is also a very recent paper. This is talking about uh, for radiology. Um, and since we are doing chest x-rays, we are going, we are in the radiology space, but going more specific to one condition. I also found this paper interesting on, uh, this is doing self-supervised learning. So they are not still claiming to be a foundation model. 
but they have 700,000 person days of variable data, which is very big. Um, and I think I, I do some work in uh, like emotion recognition, stress recognition, kind of related to human activity. Uh, and I think this is uh, this is open source. So I, I found this very maybe useful, interesting as far as I've read it. So I, I hope to use it. So maybe this builds a case for self-supervised learning when you have enough data, but maybe not good labels. So we started this work uh, two years back. We started looking at, uh, based on availability training, uh, a vision transformer model. We, we picked vision transformer because this is how things are moving in the field. Uh, a lot of recent well-performing models have vision transformer backbones. Uh, but we also know as compared to con convolution neural networks or other backbones, uh, these transformer models need a lot of data to be trained on. So the first model that we trained, we started with 30,000 images. We also not mentioned here, but we actually trained a model on MR data. Uh, what we did was just took 2D slices out of the 3D, represent 3D data space uh, for knee MRIs. Uh, and what we were trying to see was if we if we train a model on on this data set and then fine tune it on a nicely curated, well labeled data set, can we get some reasonable performance? Which we did. This was a paper in 2021, early 2022, uh, at a Mika workshop. Uh, so we extended this work and went on to do doing this for uh, X rays. We figured out being in the children's hospital as well. We have a very big chest X-ray data availability, so I think that's that's one of the motivation for going into this direction. So in the initial phases, what we did was uh, we used kind of a masked image modeling technique. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, University of Surrey, where they are developing this group mass uh, model learning technique uh, for training vision transformers. So as you can see here, we take an image, do some corruptions. The corruptions are either uh, removing the patches, like putting zeros there or introducing noise. And we did ex experiments with how much we can mask, uh, how much uh, masking we can introduce into, into the image to have reasonable performance. So the task here is reconstruction, which is a pretest task for this, our self-supervised learning. So we, we train this uh, pipeline. So, so we have reasonable reconstruction. And then once the transformer is trained, particularly the encoder. Uh, we use this encoder for various downstream tasks. So some of the benefits, uh, this self-supervised pre-training is labeled free. So it's just reconstructed imaging, uh, reconstructing images. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a lot of benefit for a lot of pediatric tasks and maybe other clinical tasks as well. With this initial model, what we did was we, we at that point in time, we used DEIT and unit R, which are two kind of state of the art, maybe not now, but at that point in time, models for classification and segmentation. Uh, and we did different classifications like COVID, non-COVID, pneumonia. We did binary multi-class classifications just to see how, how this model is working. Uh, the labels were based on the availability of labels from the data that we used. And then the segmentation was just uh, based on segmentation mask from the data that was available. Uh, so the the two results that you see here, RSNA record. So we did, I think, two important experiments, uh, which was data that is unseen, so data that is never seen in either pre-training or fine-tuning, which uh, which you can see here. So RSNA record, we just kept this data as test data. This was not seen by the fine-tuning. And then pediatric was also not seen by the fine tuning, but it was also out of distribution data because uh, RSNA record is still adult. Most of the data we have in the pre-training is adult. Uh, and later on, we use uh, Mimic and Chexpert, which are two big chest X-ray data sets. Uh, we did some analysis and the, the, the pediatric, the amount of pediatric data in these data sets is less than 5%. So still very less representative. So pediatric is an out of distribution. We consider this for our paper. So you can see the blue line. We we actually got very good performance with, with our training. And we were, this was a, a big motivation for continuing with this work and training on even uh, larger data sets. 
And for the segmentation as well, uh, we generally observe that uh, our performance improved when we have this fission transformer pre-trained on chest X-ray data set. I will show you uh, later on results on premature and newborn babies. So from that initial architecture, where we were only using a mass image modeling, we extended our architecture to include uh, contrastive learning as well. So this is uh, our uh, pipeline or uh, pre-training strategy that we are using right now. So we have combined our mass image modeling manipulation with a student teacher framework, uh, where we combine global and local contrastive learning losses. Uh, the task is still the same. We are doing reconstruction. So that's our pre-test uh, pre task. We are calling it DICOM. We have an arch archive paper on this right now. And uh, this is a much bigger model. We have, uh, in, in the paper, we talk about the, the model is trained on uh, 300,000 chest X-rays, uh, but since the paper, we have now trained it on uh, 700,000 chest X-rays. Uh, and right now we are doing experiments for different downstream tasks to see if we are reaching a foundation model yet or not. Uh, Sid, I have a question here, just briefly. Uh, this 300,000 and 700,000 chest X-rays, are these pediatric or is it still just adult chest X-rays? And pediatric is well, being treated as like out of distribution, held out set. So pediatric is still out of distribution. This, mm -hmm. These are public data sets. Uh, and I think I, it's, I, I'm not 100% sure, but most probably the representation in these public data sets is less than 5%. We are, we are doing, so it's mostly it's mimic, which is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. well, that's three hundred k, and then some other data sets. Okay. Uh, pediatric okay. data set we are collecting at children's. Uh, so we are trying to create a big cohort of mm -hmm. like curated data set, which we can use. So uh, we okay. have like right now, for example, the sickle cell disease experiment we are doing is it's with the emergency department, uh, and ED generally have like two fifty chest X rays done in a week. So hopefully okay. we will have good numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just in the process of curating that data set. Okay, thank you. So pediatric is still out of distribution. Yeah. Out of distribution. And even when you say mimic 5% representation of pediatrics, it's probably not premature babies. It's just still like people who are teenagers probably, or do you yes, think it's so it's, it's It's newborn to 21, which is a big range, age range. And yeah, like again, newborn, yeah. Yeah, so. I don't know if Mimic has a lot of like newborn uh, representation there or probably no. Not. No. <laughs> so this is a quick summary of the data set uh, that we have used. This this is the 300k uh, one or phone maybe around that number. So so Mimic CXR in 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 the DICOM paper we actually again to to test generalizability and uh, the concept of foundation model, we didn't use Mimic CXR uh, for pre-training. So this this was kind of a designed experiment. Uh, and as I said, now we have uh, an updated model where we have used Mimic CXR as uh, the pre-training, or pre-training uh, as part of the data set that is used for pre-training. So so I think Mimic CXR checkpoint is the is the biggest. Two of the biggest data sets and then uh, most of the pediatric testing we have been doing is on on a small covid data set which has only 200 samples um so in terms of clinical conditions uh these are i think the largest number of classes are in mimic and chexpert 14 which uh kind of makes it a multi-class classification problem uh, and then there is, as you can see, some TB data sets because we are doing some TB uh, studies as well. Uh, then in the downstream task, uh, this is, so although we have 14 tasks here, uh, in our experiment, we still did a binary classification. So, so right now we're extending it to a multi-class classification problem. Uh, so binary is healthy, non-healthy. That's how we did it. And then... Uh, these are details and these, these details you can find in the paper. So as you can see, we have multiple combinations of how we use pre-training data set, fine tuning and testing. Some of the data sets were uh, 
not used for testing in this study, but we are ex extending on that. And some of the data sets were never used for fine tuning. So like never seen uh, out of distribution data sets. Uh, so a quick summary of results. So uh, this is for COVID uh, and why I'm focusing more on COVID here because COVID was an important use case for us because the pediatric data set was COVID. Uh, we did two kind of uh, evaluations. One is linear probing and the other one is fine tuning. Uh, in the linear probing setting, uh, what we are doing is uh, the the weights for the uh, for most of the model is frozen. Only the last layers uh, or the classification layers are fine tuned. Uh, whereas in fine tuning, we fine tune the whole model. Uh, so for COVID pediatric, you can see linear probing is, so this is our model and we are comparing with some of state of the art models like MOPO, Dino, MAE, uh, our previous version of GMML, uh, and this is self-supervised transformer. Uh, so I would like to highlight here that with linear probing, which is computationally less expensive than fine tuning, uh, we we get the best results for COVID pediatric data sets. Only two hundred patients, uh, two hundred images, uh, and it's totally out of distribution. So in these results, just a heads up, you, we will see that some in some cases, our models not performing the best. Uh, and we are trying to build an argument that this is a foundation model, so it will not always be the best. But we are right now doing some experiments where we are fine tuning or optimizing our model for a certain task where we hope that we get state of the art performance. And, uh, Aside also I... for... Sorry, no, please go ahead. Yeah, said also for this performance, it seems they are very close to the standard vision transformer pre training. <laughs> Um, did you calculate any statistical significance test or something just to see if there is any actual performance difference? Yeah, so so for COVID, you can see it's some of the results are like 100%, which is maybe alarming sometimes. But I, I think this uh, COVID CXR3 data set is not that difficult. But for if you see uh, COVID pediatrics, this no pre-training or just fully supervised vision transformer uh, and our model, there's there's a lot of difference. So so we are also doing statistical significance test. Uh, yeah, because like 0. 0.632 and 0. 0.763 versus 0. 0.82 versus 0. 0.84, like I don't know if they are statistically significant. So 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 this uh, self-supervised transformer and DICOM, they are uh, like in terms of the core architecture, they are not very dif different. Right. I think the, the baseline would be with, with a fully supervised model. Uh, also, like if uh, as as you are rightly saying, if there is statistical significance, then then it's better. Yeah. Also, just trying to understand. So, uh, you have about two hundred patients in COVID pediatrics data set. So, um, when you say no pre training, um, like if I'm a bit confused. Like, do you uh, keep some of these two hundred patients for training if we have not done any pre training or? It's just a randomly initialized model. So no pre-training means uh, an ImageNet pre-trained model. Oh, no pre-training on okay. X-ray. Yeah. No pre-training on X-ray. It's not starting from scratch. Okay, and then Moco, Dino, all of these, they have been pre-trained on uh, public uh, adult chest X-rays, right? So we have run all these models on, on the same data set that we have. On the same 700,000, okay. So, okay. So the data set is similar, yes. The data set is similar, okay. So basically, the uh, difference between MOCO versus DICOM is um, that the architecture that you're proposing, you want to establish its superiority over the previously proposed techniques, right? Yeah, so here, the like in, in terms of these architectures, we are trying to establish that our pre-training strategy is for, for this different aspects of uh, foundation model, maybe mm -hmm. how the performance is, but other, other things as well is better than MOCO, DINO, and MAE. Oh. So all these kind of self-supervised training strategies. Oh, thank you. And then for seen and unseen, so, so we designed this experiment in a way that expert was kept uh, because it's also a slightly like com comparatively big data set and Mimic is another big data set. 
So Chexpert was uh, used uh, in the pre-training and Mimic CXR was not used in the pre-training in, in the experiments that I'm showing now. So we were trying to compare seen and unseen data in, uh, in downstream tasks. So we did the classification for both these data sets. Um, and again here, like, although again, the numbers will not be too big, but like DICOM has uh, with fine tuning the best performance. Uh, in other cases, uh, it's a mixed pack, uh, but as we can see the performance is, mostly we will, you will see that the performance to GMML and SIT, which is uh, kind of DICOM is an extension of these two methods. So uh, there there are some similarities in terms of results. So this experiment we, we particularly did for keeping seen unseen data, but as I said, uh, our updated model has used Mimic CXR in the pre-training uh, pre stage as well. Uh, then for segmentation results, these uh, are the data sets that have uh, segmentation ground tooth mass. Uh, and again, for, for, uh, for some, you can see the results are again close, but in some cases we are getting good results. I think what I'm my, myself, like I like the results was looking at the, uh, premature and newborn uh, data sets, not these uh, adult data sets. So maybe a smaller data set out of distribution, this model is more useful. Uh, so we try to uh, summarize these results in terms of uh, the foundation model strategy. Uh, so we looked at overall what's in terms of number of epochs and what's the area under the precision recall curve. Uh, so DICOM, uh, and so this is showing the speed of convergence, which I think is an important factor in, in these pre-training strategies. Uh, so we got 0 0.085, which is uh, higher than all other methods. Uh, we also compared um, like area and the spider curve for multiple tasks. So the tasks include both segmentation, classification, manifold segment uh, classification, and the speed of convergence. So we try to combine all these uh, sectors together and see how our methodology is working. Uh, so our area under this curve is 0.886, still higher than all other methods. Uh, so this kind of gives us uh, the motivation that in, towards a foundation model, this strategy is working fine. Um, we are trying to establish, as I said, for different downstream tasks that it is nicely generalizable for conditions that are related to chest x-rays. So then as, as I said in the beginning that we uh, we are also working in the federated learning space. Um, so in, in this study, what we did is uh, we tried to ex extend our self-supervised learning uh, pre-training strategy to a federated learning setting. Uh, so just a quick recap of our, our a brief introduction to the federated learning space. So we have uh, different sites uh, that hold on to their data. So there is no centralized uh, repository of the data, which generally a lot of, for example, ImageNet, every day, all, all the data points are collected at one point. Um, so this is again from coming from a pediatric space and generally for the healthcare space um, helps extending the data sets. So if if hospitals cannot share data, they can still participate in the study and hopefully that augments the availability of data. Uh, so the federated learning setup has uh, two main components, clients which are holding onto their data and a server uh, which is uh, running the whole machine learning pipeline. So it's aggregating the, the, the weights of the model as they are, the, as, as the model travels through the sites. Uh, so the strategy that we are using is called scatter and gather. So, so the server basically scatters the model to all the sites, the sites to their local training, sends the weights back to the server that's gathering, and then the aggregator combines all the weights um, for the next iteration. So this process is done multiple times uh, until whatever the criteria is for stopping the training. Uh, so, so for this, we have used these seven sites. Uh, 
uh, basically this is again coming from public data set we don't have these are not real sites that have collaborated in this study but we we actually took a public data set representing different sites and in our implementation we considered them as individual sites um and then again, we did some experiments with what data to use in pre-training, uh, what kind of conditions we are looking at and all that stuff. Uh, it's mostly focused on COVID. So because our CNH data set is for this study is related to COVID. Uh, for implementation, we uh, collaborated with uh, Rhino Health, which is a commercial federated computer computing platform. Uh, they are, HIPAA compliant and they are approved for implementation at our hospital. So that is one of the reasons we use them. Uh, and they basically provide a platform which uh, streamlines implementing the federated learning part. So uh, their dashboards, their uh, and, and their engineering support helps speed up implementing the federated learning pipelines. Uh, so the Rhino client is, uh, they have again, two components, Rhino Client, which is on-prem, like installed on our systems or, or our servers. And then Rhino Cloud, which is the server part, which is all the orchestration of the models. And so in, in our experiments, it's it's doing the scattering gather, uh, gathering part. Uh, so Rhino uh, FL Compute is built on NVIDIA and NVFlare. So NVFlare is uh, open source and public. Uh, so that is a connection to open source, but, but anyways, Rhino client or Rhino F FCP is uh, proprietary, it's not open source. So it, it has to be like, you have to install and do all those things through, uh, through the Rhino organization. Uh, so we did this uh, implementation with the Rhino compute platform. Uh, in terms of results, we wanted to establish or we were trying to see how much of a degradation we see in performance when we do self-supervised learning with vision transformers in a federated setting. As established in literature that with federated learning, you can see some drop in performance. So we're trying to see it, if that is, uh, and again, we are trying to also see from a statistical point of view if that is significant or not significant. Uh, so here are the results I will just focus on. So vision transformer is again a uh, vision transformer that is pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, vision transformer self-supervised learning is where we have used self-supervised learning, but the data is centralized. And vision transformer FSSL is uh, this, the vision transformer trained with, in a federated manner, as I've shown in the previous slide. Um, so if we, if we look at the ROC and accuracy as, for example, two parameters, uh, there is slight drop in performance, but compared to the vision transformer pre-trained on ImageNet, uh, the performance is uh, much, much better uh, in terms of both ROC and accuracy. So, so this experiment for now is done on, uh, on the COVID uh, classification task uh, and as uh, and we have used uh, the CNS data as the test data set. Just a couple of questions. Is this with adult use case or pediatric for COVID diagnosis? Uh, so these results are for, uh, for, so this is the data distribution. Uh, so the results that I'm showing is for pediatric classification, right. uh, but we have used data sets that are coming from different sites and mostly adult. Uh, the, but they are trained, uh, but they are being used for pre training. Okay. Um, other question. So you used five, six sites uh, in the federated learning, um, and yet uh, the performance was worse than just using the self supervised learning. Uh, the federated self supervised learning was worse, uh, slightly worse than without it. Um, was so that there's, a, there's <laughs> a drop in performance? Yes. Yeah. Is that surprising? I, I think you, for us it was you're using because VIT SSL that's just one site's data, correct? That's all all data collected at once. Uh, so this oh, is oh at central. Oh, okay, so you brought data. all the data centrally. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, central hosting is the best you can possibly get. Yes, yeah, that's the best. Yeah. Okay, so you're getting somewhat close. Um, I'll just make a comment. There are different ways of aggregating the weights in federated learning, uh, as you probably know. Um, 
Model averaging, which I guess is the same as scatter and gather, is the simplest method, but generally not the best method for uh, transferring weights uh, between sites um, or other methods. But in particular, it, what's uh, another thing that's a big factor for you to think about is if there's any heterogeneity in the data distributions across the sites that uh, you're doing federated learning with, that's going to degrade the performance uh, of the federated approach, particularly if you're doing model averaging. So um, to the extent you understand the heterogeneity in data at the different sites uh, and maybe work with subsets that are more homogeneous, uh, you would probably get closer to uh, the centralized performance. Yeah, thank, thanks. That's that's. Uh, I think that's very important. I, 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 and, and the reason we just kept it simple for using scatter and gather or model leveraging, we were trying to uh, like take our model, self-supervised learning model to a federated space and then start looking into different optimization in terms of what kind of averaging or model aggregation is uh, that we can use. So I think that that is our definitely the next step uh, in terms of getting a boost in the performance. And we are also trying to get sites where we can have some real sites and actually test on some conditions because this is now set up and we have a trained model. So that, but, but a, more, a trained model is not important, but setting up the self-supervised learning strategy is maybe important and then evaluate in real sites how it works. Yeah, so moving on, uh, uh, I will I briefly touch upon the security in federated learning setting, which we are uh, exploring with some of our collaborators at Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, so this is a uh, this is a work that is under review, and we were looking at uh, model inversion attacks. Uh, so this is uh, we actually uh, with this collaboration we came up with this attack where we can actually reconstruct images. Uh, once this attack is applied. So how it works is um, it's based on the assumption that the server, the parameter server or the central server is uh, trying to reconstruct data. Uh, in some clinical settings, there is always an argument that this might not be the condition, but I think it's uh, still important to consider uh, if this situation happens and what will be the outcomes. Uh, so based on that assumption, uh, this is our attack mechanism. Uh, so this is uh, this attack mechanism works in a way where the server attacks a particular client. So it's not attacking all the clients. It's attacking a particular client, could be client one, client two, or whatever clients we have. Uh, how it works is that uh, the, the parameter server puts two linear layers behind the model, the actual model. Uh, and then it also needs an auxiliary data set, which, which should ideally have similar data distribution as the underlying data set. So this assumption, um, we, we experimented with this attack using chest x-rays. Uh, uh, I think one of the thing that needs to happen for this to be successful is to know what kind of data is being used at the sites. Uh, that we know is a limitation of, of this model. So we here we are assuming that we know that we are working with chest X-rays, and so the auxiliary data set is uh, comprised of chest X-rays that can be uh, collected from public sources. So the first step is crafting the model. The crafted model, as I said, has two linear layers. Uh, so for the target client, this is uh, these layers act as linear leakage layers. For all other clients, these are initialized with zeros. So, so that's why they are not targeted. Uh, so first step is crafting. And then uh, the second step is setting this, uh, sending this model to the client. And once the updates come back, uh, uh, there's we have a mathematical model, which is used for reversing uh, the data points. So in this case, the data points are just X-ray images. So these are some of the results that we got from from this attack. Uh, actually, the reconstructions are 
super good. Uh, as you can see, the, the PSNR and SSIM, which we use as matrix for evaluating these reconstructions, uh, the numbers are very high. Uh, also, looking at these, uh, like it's, it's difficult to tell the difference between the original and the recovered image. So that shows that the recovery is very good. Uh, we also did some uh, analysis in terms of how quickly uh, we can reconstruct images uh, with this model. So we use different batch sizes. Uh, the data sets that we are using are just MNIST, which is uh, an MNIST representation of uh, chest X-rays. So it's it's small images, 28 cross 28, but we also did COVID CXR4 data set, uh, which is more uh, of a reasonable size for a chest X-ray. So we experimented with batch sizes going from 100 to 500. Uh, and we looked at the reconstruction rate in terms of uh, like, we looked at the reconstruction rate, the PSNR, SO, SIM, uh, and the time it takes for our attack to reconstruct the images. So these are in seconds, so not not very big numbers. So it, it shows that it, it can reconstruct large batches of data very quickly. And then for a downstream task to see its clinical applicability, we we did a, a classification for healthy, non-healthy X-ray images. Um, and as you can see, Again, using the the same region transformer model, which is pre trained, uh, which is uh, pre trained using self supervised learning and fine tune, uh, actually the performance is uh, very high. So, so right now what we have done is we have focused on just one thing where we can, based on once the data is reconstructed, can we do a clinically meaningful downstream task, which is identifying abnormality. Uh, we are still looking into uh, reconstructing information that. Identifies patient information. So, for example, for some chest X-ray, there is uh, some patient information on the chest X-ray. Uh, we are right now trying to see if we can extract some, maybe patient age or sex or whatever, uh, from those tests, from those writings. So, this is uh, how we are extending this work right now. Uh, but so I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, this data set, chest MNIST and COVID, is this one of the auxiliary data sets that you uh, mentioned in your um, attack diagram? These data sets are acting as the auxiliary data set, right? So these are the data sets that we are reconstructing. The auxiliary data set are random samples from all these public data sets that I'm mentioning. So this is actually, okay. uh, this is the, right now we are considering that, for example, Chest MNIST is the target site. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Or okay. COVID CXR4 is the target site. So that's how it works. Okay. Uh, I was trying to understand. You said uh, you need to know the data distribution, uh, right? So I was thinking, like, how closely do you need to know that? Is it you just need to know that you're trying to reconstruct chest X rays or, uh, or by like matching the distribution? You mean like similar distribution of healthy versus abnormal or. Uh, like you need to match the age. Um, so like how closely you need to, uh, this auxiliary data set need to match uh, the, the attack client data. Yes, so so for now what we have, we have not, not done a lot of experiments, but we know that this is kind of a, a thing that needs to happen before the attack is successful. So what we have experimented with right now is the auxiliary data, data set should be just x-rays not looking at age groups or healthy, non-healthy. It should be uh, chest X-rays. Uh, but I think, as you said, uh, we need to maybe look into this more uh, and see if we have, uh, how far it can be from the actual data set distribution and still work. So that, I think because our the auxiliary data set that we choose for this experiment is very similar to the actual data set, Maybe that's one of the reasons for such a high performance. And as you move away from that, maybe the performance will drop. So this is uh, definitely uh, something to explore, but uh, okay. not done so Thank far. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so quickly, I will run through some of the uh, use cases. And these are downstream tasks. So these are small data sets that we collected in-house and uh, from our pre-trained model, uh, uh, we ran some experiments on this data set. So this is acute chest syndrome, which is, uh, I, I, 
like clinically i would say people who are working with this say they they say it's very looks very similar to pneumonia but it's still not pneumonia uh but this happens uh for for sickle cell disease patients when they have acute chest syndrome is as well uh this is kind of a clinically significant condition uh and have like adverse outcomes for for kids who come come in with sickle cell disease uh at children's national what we have identified is that we have like 1800 pediatric cases every year who have who come in uh to our ed or outpatient clinics for with with the sickle cell condition but generally this is um like one in 365 african american descent uh population have sickle cell disease uh so the, I, i'm just trying to show the prevalence it's it's mostly prevalent in african american Americans or Hispanic American populations, uh, not maybe affecting that much the white population. Uh, and eighty-five percent of children with ACS present with fever have uh, like uh, so they have like eighty-five percent of children with ACS have fever. So this is one of a clinical indicator, uh, and they also have chest pain. Uh, most of the sickle cell disease patients who come in have a pain crisis, which has to be handled. Uh, so how what we were trying to look in this study was uh, the radiologist read time for these chest X-rays because once a radiologist read is available for the X-ray, uh, then they initiate other clinical uh, interventions. So at Children's Hospital, the daytime study uh, studies uh, for chest X-ray, the median read time is fifty five minutes, but for overnight studies, this uh, becomes very big. It's four hundred and one. 0.5 minutes. Uh, and that can delay the other in in interventions, could be giving pain medicine uh, or something like that. So that can delay if, if the study is performed overnight. So what we were trying to do is develop a tool using our model uh, to improve the read time. So we have this tool right now running at our ED. Uh, it's a very simple tool developed for just uploading a chest X-ray image, and it gives a probability of acute chest syndrome or uh, or healthy. So it can maybe help uh, ED attending or a physician who is at that point in time looking at the chest X-ray to maybe initiate uh, an early radiology read or something like that. Um, so this pilot study, uh, because it's right now is real, it is implemented in real time. We are doing some cases, not all of, because we have a kind of IRB approval for this. Uh, the the thing that I would like to highlight is the the read time is 0 0.0068 second, and it's it's just depending upon our algorithm running on the machine that's hosting this, and this is independent of whether the study is done at day or night. Uh, so this is uh, in 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 so in in some of the cases that we have evaluated uh, the outcome has been good so we are right now studying on how to integrate it into the radio radiology pipeline because this is what i'm presenting here is being done by ed physicians not radiologists i have a question sorry this is brody uh, i also am a neighbor of yours i'm at georgetown so i have a lot of i'm an adult physician who sees a lot of um, uh, you know, this population with the high sickle cell disease burden in the geographic area that you are currently at. So I have a question about this is that in reality, always very non comical about the, do your radiologists actually say acute chest syndrome? Because I think this kind of offer radiologists to have different because it depends upon the clinic scenario. Because if the patient has a sickle cell patient or is the patient having an ongoing crisis. Like on the x ray, it looks like, as you said, like any other pneumonia. So I'm curious what group of radiologists in the state. Yes, yeah, so maybe what I heard, uh, your voice was breaking, but I will try to. So, so what uh, our interaction with the radiologist so far is that uh, I think in the radiology reports, they they have different ways of de describing what this is, but I'm mostly working with the ED on this, and uh, our ED physician wants to have uh, an initial indication of if there's acute chest syndrome, 
So right now we are trying to extend this into a longitudinal study because in, in our settings, we have multiple chest x-rays performed. And then uh, there are situations when the condition, a, a, a kid can come in with sickle cell with no acute chest syndrome and maybe after a few hours or in the next day, it converts into acute chest syndrome. So we were actually trying to, in, in some of the cases, we gave them probabilities of our model uh, with a confidence interval. And we were trying to see, for example, if the model is saying it's 99% sure that it's acute chest syndrome, then we discussed this with some radiologists and they saw they they confirmed that this is a clear case of acute chest syndrome, but some of our predictions were like 60% uh, confident that it's acute chest syndrome uh, or 40%. And, and we were discussing some case use cases where actually it was a ACS negative case, which converted into a ACS positive uh, after a few hours or, or in the next day. Uh, so the radiologist, Input to this is, uh, I think, in, in a sense, for the ED physicians, it's important because they, they never take a decision without a radiologist read. Uh, and as I said, this is, as part of this project, we are trying to uh, minimize the read time or maybe initiate an early read. So that's maybe- yeah, Don't you think that in that case, it's important that you connect it with PACS because if it is download, upload, it will increase the read time even more, right? Definitely, and this is a kind of our internal thing because uh, the 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 radiology is very supportive of this, but how the packs work and how the data pipelines flows uh, in in the hospital, we are still not being able to integrate this into the packs. But that's the idea; it should be integrated into the packs. No, it's, and it should be DICOM DICOM listener, right? Like that. Whenever a new check 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 comes in, you just run the algorithm. Yeah, we are not getting the API for that, but as you said, this is how it should work. It's still a lot of delay because, and that's why we have very few cases. We have to train or have an ED physician uh, or attendee who is happy to do this. It's an, it's, it's, it's an extra job for them. If it's part of, the, part of the packs, then it will be like automated and we have a bigger state. It actually doesn't need to be part of the packs. There yeah, are exactly. they're open source or they're called orchestrators um, that will, you know, trigger, you know, take the image from the packs and push it to an algorithm. Uh, you can make any kind of workflow you want automated. Take a look at look up orchestrators or DICOM. Exactly. Or... So it, you understand that right? you just need a query node. Not, you don't need to integrate it with packs. Yeah, just, uh, we are. Uh, just, that's what I'm, we are not getting. We are not getting a uh, API or. No, it does not... need an API. It, as that I was mentioning, it's just called orchestration software. Okay. Okay. So you just need the back. A... You just need to make one port open. That's it. Okay. Yeah. I I will have a look at that. Sure. Well, this is the common approach for how to integrate AI into the workflow. Right. Thank you. So for TB detection, uh, since we are coming on time as well, I will quickly go through it. Uh, in this study, we were trying to do zero shot TB detection for pediatric cases. Uh, most of the pipeline is similar. We have not used our model here for now, but we, we did actually, because we had models trained from Dino, Moco, and MA, this, this work is uh, going to be presented at ISP this year. Uh, so here we, uh, we did, so what we were trying to see was to explore self-supervised learning in pediatric TB detection in a zero shot setting. Um, so this pipeline, maybe we have covered, then we uh, we did again linear probing and fine tuning, and then we, we actually classified TB non-TB. Uh, so here we did two uh, main experiments. One is adult TB classification, uh, and the other one is pediatric TB classification. For pediatric TB classification, we did zero shot. So this is again a TB data set from Children's Hospital. Uh, and this is not, uh, so this is zero shot setting. So there's no, no fine tuning involved. Uh, so we are just getting the outcomes. Uh, and I, I think just to quickly summarize uh, here, we, we actually got some good results uh, for this uh, experiment. And basically, uh, because our pediatric data set, we have more cases. We have not curated all of the data set, but we are trying to expand that. 
uh, but we did this pilot again with uh, a few cases to see how, how self-supervised learning is helping in this space. And for, for lung segmentation, uh, we have this pipeline. I would like to highlight one point here that for this, uh, our, our results really got a boost when we did an ROI detection. So, so what we did was use YOLO V8 to get ROI you know, to identify the region in the in the X-ray, uh, which which is representing lung, and then use our uh, models for segmentation. Uh, so we did this experiment with two datasets. One is premature babies, and the other one is uh, newborns and uh, kids with age less than two. And I would like to show uh, results here. So, so just as, as a comparison, we just use out of the box unit R, like unit R model uh, for segmenting these data sets uh, and then our pre-training fine tuning stat strategy and then getting the outcomes. Uh, and for these premature babies, um, as you can see, the we actually get some very nice results, which we are trying to expand on and see how this can be useful for making clinical decisions. And again, the improvement is coming from self-supervised learning. It's coming from self-supervised learning. So, self so unit R is, yeah, on, on chest oh. x-ray. So this is uh, mostly what I had on chest x-rays. We are right on time. It depends how you want to move forward. If uh, The next few slides are just a uh, general introduction of our lab and what we are doing. So okay. if you want, I can continue or we can do discussion. Uh, you can continue and uh, if people who want to drop, they can. We can just keep recording. Yeah, so so as I said, the lab is, uh, is doing uh, multiple things in the machine learning, deep learning space. Uh, uh, we are, uh, for, for example, to highlight uh, one one of the projects that we are doing is focusing on multimodal data is for epilepsy, which I will show in the next slide. Uh, we are also trying to develop a digital twin for, so we have identified a use case which can benefit from digital twin for, for the pediatric space. And we think that we have reasonable data for that. Uh, so right now we are trying to come up with uh, models that can help uh, setting up that digital twin and see how clinically useful it will be. Um, we are trying to do some projects which like we, we touched upon sickle cell disease, but uh, we are trying to like as a research lab, because we have some models that we have developed, we are trying to implement that in the clinical space um, and like working on quantifying how it helps in improving the clinical practice. Uh, so some of the themes, so we, I mostly cover chest x-rays, but we are doing a lot of work with brain image analysis. Uh, our, our lab is actively involved with the uh, Mikai Bratz challenge, and we have we are actively contributing a data set for the pediatric uh, Bratz challenge, which for the first time last year was uh, we we had a component on pediatric brain tumor segmentation, which we are continuing this year. Uh, we are also working with uh, with our cardiac uh, clinical partners, uh, looking at uh, cardiac surgeries in, in, in the pediatric space and how cardiac surgeries uh, can affect the brain. So for example, the ECMO procedure and when that is performed, uh, how it can induce brain injury or seizures. So we are working with the cardiac ICU and the NICU, with the neonatal ICU on these uh, problems. Uh, and also so for some physiological signal analysis, uh, mostly focusing on uh, mental health assessments. Uh, we have done some studies on like using variable sensors and physiological physiological data for identifying stress and emotion. Um, so this is kind of a, some some of the scopes that we work in. I just wanted to highlight a couple of studies. Uh, so this uh, this is a pipeline that we use for mental health assessment. Uh, where we have some variable sensors, as you can see. So we have EEG coming from Muse, which is a variable headset. Uh, then we also have PPG GSR. Uh, for benchmarking, getting like ground truths, we are using PSS questionnaire. So this is a questionnaire that kind of quantifies um, 
your mental health stress i would say for uh, for the last 30 days uh, then we use some standard pre processing for the eeg and physiological physiological data feature extraction uh, of these signals so pre processing feature extraction and then uh, doing some classifiers you will not see deep learning or large models here because these data sets are small most of these data sets are curated in the lab so we have like on average around 20 to 30 case uh, use cases uh, where we collect this data in different settings uh, uh, so sometimes we have baseline conditions sometimes we also try to create uh, situations where we induce stress uh, so we are looking at stress classification for either binary classification or three class classification and then on the multimodal learning space uh, so this is uh this is a project that uh, right now we are working with uh, neurosurgery in our hospital they have collected a lot of data multimodal data for epilepsy patients who are treated through surgery so this condition is called drug resistant epilepsy uh the sources of data that we have is functional mri uh, standard mri diffusion tensor imaging and uh, I think a very, very important aspect that I am focusing on is stereo EEG. Uh, so we are trying to explore in this space how self-supervised learning can help. Uh, the strategy that we are using is we convert the EEG data into spectrograms. So we go from the EEG space, which is uh, kind of a one-dimensional signal, uh, to a 2D representation. So we're trying to explore how we can use all these vision transform models trained on images uh, and apply in this space. So we have this initial study on uh, which uh, which we published in, in a couple of uh, conferences where we use spectrograms uh, and again using mass image modeling to come up with identifying seizures and uh, spectrograms that have no seizures. And then on the digital twin space, uh, we are looking at this work on uh, peer Robin sequence. Uh, so this condition, uh, we have some collaborators who work in different space. For example, this can be treated through a surgery or there can be more uh, uh, restrictive treatments, which does not involve surgery. So in this project, we have collaborators from Stanford. Most of the, uh, mostly the Stanford collaborators are working on non-surgical treatment strategies. And uh, most of the data that I'm getting from Children's Hospital is looking at surgical treatment. Um, so this is, uh, again, multimodal data, longitudinal. It has imaging. It has some physiological data like sleep studies. Uh, the idea behind this effort is to create a digital twin for these kids because these are like newborns to under one year old and have a digital twin space where different um, surgical treatments can be analyzed before actually treating the patient. Uh, we, we hope and assume that this will have uh, like better outcomes for, for these kids because as far as I know and as, as, as I've discussed with the clinicians here, uh, these surgeries, they help a lot, but they also have, uh, like the kids have to come back for other conditions that can come out of, like as a conse consequence of the initial surgery that is done for treating the condition. So, yep, that's it uh, from from my side. I'm happy to take questions. And I also put uh, a link in, in this QR code if, if you want to connect and like talk more offline. Thank you very much, Dr. Nur. Uh, everyone, let's give our speaker a virtual round of applause. And then if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Uh, Dr. Anur, uh, could you go back to two slides previous, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I was wondering, uh, so uh, would you explain about, uh, so for here, so EEG signal can be counted as the yeah, so could you explain again how uh, you pre-process the, the, this EEG signal images to use as the input of the DEIT? So, so the basic idea is we are using uh, spectrograms. So we take, uh, we basically apply windowing on EEG signals. We take a window and uh, on that selected window, we use a 
conversion to spectrogram. So these are this is how it looks like. So what happens is that so from my experience, what happens is that you can create depending on how you are doing windowing and what kind of filters you are using, you can create uh, a lot of like a ton of spectrograms from from a EEG data. Most of the EEG data that we have is is uh, very long. So for example, SEEG when it's done, it's done for multiple days. So you have like EEG data for for, for days. So so ultimately, what happens is you end up having a lot of spectrograms, which I what we considered was good enough for training a vision transformer model. Uh, I think one of the th challenge that we have is this is highly unbalanced. So, yeah. so we have you have to like come up with strategies. So so that is another topic. But the the pre processing is uh, we take EEG signals, do windowing, and then come up with spectrograms. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for the speaker? Yes, no. Uh, okay, then we can thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Anwar. Thank you very much for sharing this presentation with us. It was very informative. And if people have any more questions, we will put them in touch with you. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.